Vietnam does for your audio visual sensibilities, I find, not, not just on the night itself. Uh, it's my pleasure today to introduce uh, John Barnett, who I'm sure you will all know, but it is uh, worth introducing him again because the track record is unparalleled uh, uh, in this country. Uh, John started out as a distributor in the 1970s, uh, and uh, he has the distinction, amongst the many feature films that he's produced, that five of them, no less than five, are in the uh, top ten all-time uh, box office successes of New Zealand history. Uh, they are, of course, the only critic, one of two, uh, whale writer, uh, what becomes of the brokenhearted, and uh, what, what fact. And amongst those, whale writer is uh, by several multiples the uh, most successful New Zealand film at the international box office uh, history. As you know, he's also uh, <laughs> pictures. Yeah. 
responsible for everything. <laughs>
right through its development, right through every iteration of the script, right through all the funding, right through into the production. And when it's produced, and everybody else has talked about having worked on the show for six week shoot, or eight week shoot, or 10 week shoot, or 20 weeks post production, they've all gone home. And then your job starts, because you've got to get this into a market. You've got to get it into a position that people see it. And you've got to be working with the distributors here and with the distributors internationally. And that goes on forever. It never stops. Crook Rock Flats we made in 1985. It generates money now, but it doesn't just generate money. We actually have to keep working it. And what I hope that at the end of this hour, some of you will think about is that your superannuation is the projects that you create that generate the long-term revenues for you. Because this is not just a business about doing this thing for fees. Because we're all increasingly under pressure on budgets. Therefore, the key is to make things at a price where you can actually get money back. And that is the business. And there's nothing to be scared of about that. And there's nothing to be scared of holding on to most of that money. Yes, reward other people. But, you know, I, I hear so often from producers who come to me with a budget and say, I think I've made a mistake here, and they paid everybody else the rate that they asked. And the producer, for example, on a, on a, I don't know, two, two and a half million dollar budget, the producer might say, well, I'm getting 50 or 60 grand, and the director's getting 50 or 60 grand. The director's really important, but the director will have gone home about five years before your job's finished. And you aren't going to get more money unless that picture actually generates revenue. So if you want to stay in the business, you've got to create projects that are going to get you money. And there are some pointers to this. And it's really, that's the question, what do audiences want? Because it's really nice to make films that you want to make, but in the end, what are audiences going to go and see? Now yesterday was really interesting because you know that interview with with Ben and um, and I've seen that film and I think I think it's a terrific film. And is George Lyle here? No. George came and asked me afterwards, he said, would I have taken on that film uh, if Ben had come to me with that script? And more importantly, would I have, would I have put up 20% of the money? And the answer to both of those was no. Um, however, I guess if Ben had come along and said, I've got Helen Hunt and John Hawks and William Macy, and it's going to cost less than the money that's being spent on the escalator scheme, um, I might have said yes. Because the, the conditions change. But, but you know, in my view, I would have thought that was a tough call for the audience. Now, having seen the film, I think it'll get four Oscar nominations, and I think it'll do quite well. Um, these are the top New Zealand films released at the New Zealand box office. And I think that there's some, some interesting things um, about those topics. Um, I think until you get down to uh, In My Father's Den, One of the things that, that we tend to make in the film business is films that have got, um, that, that exist already in some other environment and that have a, 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 a familiarity link to the audience. So that when you talk about the film, the audience knows exactly what you mean. Now, Boy is a kind of admiration about that, although it is a type of story and there's a lot of heat on Taika, and he made some short films. But basically, um, he made a film about his life, and it was enormously well told, and it resonated very much with New Zealand uh, audiences. World's Fastest Indian was about a guy that, you, that the media could grab straight away. Bert Munro, Roger's story of trying to make it for 30 years, but Bert Munro, from Invercargill, fastest man on the salt flats, that's the kind of story that we love to hear. So the media like that. Once the Warriors, it was, you know, 80,000 books have been sold. So you know that on day one, you're going to get an audience in the film, in the cinema, and you know pretty much who that audience is. Well, right up, exactly the same. Um, 
you know, we, it, it's interesting, it took 17 years to get the screen, and the biggest hurdle was getting New Zealand investment in it, because at the time, because we're actually uh, development of that predated Warriors, um, people said, no, I want to go and see a Maori film. Uh, interesting when you look at those list of things. Um, but, but it was in existence. See, only really, in my view, the uh, naked Samoans were well enough known to be uh, to put them on a poster. You knew that you had an audience. What becomes of the Broken Hearted? Sequel to Once War uh, to Once for Warriors. Footrock Flats. We actually um, had Morgan Gallup, the uh, research company, do research in Australia and New Zealand, and over 80 percent of, ha of households were familiar with the comic strip. Um, Secondhand wedding is most probably, although it's, um, uh, it, it's based on Nick's own story, and it sort of falls in between the two. Top twins, well, you know, I've said to other people, I still think a lot of people who turned up on the first day thought they were going to a concert, um, but they had a hell of a good time, and they went out and told everybody else about it. Sione's was a sequel. Goodbye Pork Pie, absolutely original. That's most probably the first absolutely original piece. Jeff Murphy sitting around at the back of Andy Grant's garage in Arrow Street, and he comes up with it. Um, in My Father's Den, a book, Scarface. Well, again, it's, it's territory that an audience is familiar with, and particularly if you open the film in Dunedin, which they did, you know that you're going to get people there on the first day. Out of the Blue, court case we all knew about, Home by Christmas, um, well, by now, Gaylene has a reputation for making those sorts of things. The other thing is to look and see that in the case of Once the Warriors, Wild Rider, Sione's, Broken Hearted, Football Flats, Top Twins, Sione's 2, uh, Out of the Blue, um, might be one other. But certainly, eight of those 15 films were created by the producer, not by the director, not by the writer. And in this case, I'm, still, I'm not counting Roger as the producer. I'm, I'm just saying that the genesis of the idea came from the producer. And that's the kind of thing that you need to be thinking about and, um, you know, as to what sort of stories people go and see. And the other thing, just quickly, is that when you look at a picture like, uh, the sessions that we did yesterday and see how that fits in the, uh, in the box office, it's pretty tough because audiences in New Zealand want escapism. And that's just last week uh, or the week before that you can see. You know, it's the big Hollywood pictures. Surprise at number four is the uh, Indian film. Uh, the campaign, big surprise. It's actually about American politics. Um, but it's quite a way down until you come to something like Lake Bloomers, Bernie, World Leader's Daughter, um, The Way, uh, I Wish It Royal Affair, that these are not <coughs> Hollywood pictures. And that's what you're going to go up against when you put your film out. It's also, I come back to a point about who's the audience on day one. At number 18 is a film called The Way. Has anybody seen that? It's, um, uh, Martin Sheen and Emilio Estevez and they walk on the Pilgrim's Walk in Spain from Campostello. Probably help me here, it's not my That's right. It's a it's a it's a walk that, that Catholic pilgrims go on. Now, you know, it's a pretty soft film. But one of the distributors did. They went straight to the churches with this film. And they took, they've taken more money in Australia and New Zealand than almost anybody else. Because you thought about who's the film going to go to. Mind you, that's the distributor, not the producer. Um, and there's your top 40 this week in America. And again, you can see that's what people go and see. Right? Um, it's uh, hard to see. Well, all of these, in order to get to these numbers, they have to appeal to a wide audience. You have to know who they're going to go and see, who's going to go and see it right at the outset, who your primary audience is, but people want escapism. They want something different. 
Um, yeah, okay. What films we 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 got there? Yeah. Any questions? Um, out in Australia, these are these are the Australian films that have worked. And again, you look at at some of the same criteria. I mean, Crocodile Dundee, Paul Hogan was the most famous comedian in Australia. Australia, well, if you call it Australia in Australia, it's going to do quite well. They, um, <laughs> best selling book, Happy Feet, came off a, a you know, had, had Hollywood behind it. Moulin Rouge, uh, by now the, the production direction team is pretty famous. Um, Dundee 2, Strictly Ballroom was a surprise. Uh, that was that was a, a breakout. The dish brought to you by the guys who delivered a prime time show on Channel 10 week after week after week. Snowy River, Australian icon. Priscilla, Queen of the Desert, where you know who the first day's audience are, and if they love it, the word of mouth spreads. Um, Muriel's was, was a breakout. Uh, Mouse Last Dance, that was probably the first serious picture uh, based on the book. Young Einstein uh, captured a tiny little moment in which Yahoo Serious was um, <laughs> thought to be very funny and no one's heard from it since. Uh, Lantana, also um, the first cut crime story. Gallipoli, and you go back to 1981 dollars at 11.4, so inflation adjusted, it would be much higher, but you've got to go higher. And Wild Boy is interesting. Anybody see Wild Boy? Wild yeah. Boy is the equivalent of Sierra Club. It's a bunch of Greek guys who ran a comedic um, a group called um, Wogs Out of Work in Acropolis now, and they used to do a lot of television. Uh, and what they did was focus on the fact that a large immigrant group within society pretty much keeps to its own rules while the rest of the creative world tries to figure out what's going on around it. So it's very fun. Uh, the piano, uh, yeah, Australian film, okay. uh, and the other speakers. So, so, um, so, and again, that is your, you know, those sort of all the big hitters, and you can see, interesting, I think, until you get to the Passion of Christ, that uh, mostly they're about worlds that are fantasy. I don't want to go into the Passion of Christ as well, but, um, yeah. How do you choose the subject? Um, I've got a few, I think, I've got a few, here we go. I've got a few, I'm going to put a few topics up and, and get some <laughs> feedback. Um, you know, this is a pretty important um, discussion, debate. Is there a film in it? And what happens next? Depends on your audience. I, I think that's the key question. Depends what happens next. And where would you tell the story from? You know? um, it was purely fictional, an account of what would happen if the writers aren't given the body. And you know, there's a from that point of view would be, um, you know, either a fictional court case um, as a dramatic piece, or an actual conflict over, like you know, protesting violence at a dam. Um, it most probably has to be about some body doing this, but until we know how it plays out. And then, you know, will it play anywhere else? Um, if that's, hmm? Will it play outside New Zealand? And will it play inside New Zealand? If people are dollarized about it. Um, Valerie Adams going for gold. Is there a story? Is there a movie story? I mean, she's going to get a meal back. It's a great story of, of, of um, um, overcoming all sorts of different things. But, I, you know, I'm not sure it's a thing, but Lydia Cho, any bet? 
Yeah. And the stage. Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's more to the story than a New Zealand golfer. It's a woman from, from who, who's come, left one culture, come to another, and in a sense left a whole lot of stuff behind, but now wants to reconnect with it. And the point is, at which point do you tell the story? Because clearly her life is going to be, um, uh, hopefully, filled with a lot more success. stories that came off the newspaper. Smash Palace, Roger read a story about um, uh, a father in a custody battle 
who kidnapped his daughter and took a, a brief when Bush with her. And out of the blue, Stephen, I think, was the, um, had, had uh, followed the, the, as many people had, the Aramoana case. So, you know, these are two classic examples, one very directly and one slightly obliquely about how to take stories off the, off the headlines. The thing about Smash Palace is that Roger didn't take the story just of the guy on the run. He, he built it into a cinematic um, uh, framework. And when he came to release the picture, the fact that it was based on a true story was not necessarily something that, that publicity used at all. The story worked on its own. So you can find in these stories, in, in the same way as, as Ben was looking for um, sex with, with cripples, you can find a story that, that can work for you. <coughs> so to kind of get there, um, what's the process that you use to find these things? Really, the first question is, do you like it? It's going to take you a long, 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 long time to make this film. It, you know, yesterday, I was amazed that he got that film up in five years. See, only when he took five years, and that was after I walked into the office, said we wanted to write it, actually got it written, and then we went to the Film Commission, and then it took four years. And it just takes a long time. But if you don't really like it, you're not going to put your time into it. It's just, if it's something you kind of turn to when everything else is done, um, it's unlikely to get made. And that's, that's really the, the question that goes with this. If you like it, will you champion it? Because you're a person, a producer, who's going to be standing there every day thinking, we should make this film, we should make this film, we should make this film. And when you sit in a room, as, as we have at South Pacific, where we've got a development team, if no one on the team, it's quite often that we look at something and everybody says, oh, that's really good, that would be interesting. And if you ask the question, who's going to champion it, uh, people will you know, come out. Yeah. <laughs> It isn't going to happen, because if there isn't somebody there carrying this project, it isn't going to get made. Um, how long will it take? Just be realistic. It isn't going to take a year. It isn't going to take two years. Most probably isn't going to take three years. It's going to take a lot longer. Um, well, right, it was atypical, but as I said, it was 17 years from the time I read the book until it got to the screen. Uh, Fortunately, that wasn't the only thing I did. Um, but can you make it? That's another question. Because in New Zealand, there's really only one guy who says yes to everything. And that's Peter Jackson. Because you know, the fact is that if somebody stood here 25 years ago and said, oh, we're going to make a troll for you for Lord of the Rings, everybody would have said, what's he going to make? But the fact is that for many of you and us, um, you look at some projects and you just think, we don't think we can make that. I mean, when I look at, I haven't read Barry Harker, or when I haven't read Paul Morrison, the truth is, could we make, could we make that period, um, 18, uh, 19th century, in that rural setting? I don't think we could. So that often becomes the point at which you say, we have to pass on this. Doesn't mean someone else can't make it. But the question is, can you make it? Um, is there an audience? Because, again, you can read some terrific books. And you read some, you know, the, the hot genre at the moment is crime books. And whether it's Joe Nesbo, um, or Wallander, or, or James Lee Burke, or uh, Eleanor Leonard, or whatever it is, and you look how few of them have become satisfactory adaptations. And there aren't all that many, because in general, mainstream audiences want the bad guys to be uh, dealt to, and quite often in crime books, they're not, because they're the most interesting characters. But also, there's a, you can run things in parallel, and you know, you can have one, a one page chapter, which tells you what the characters are, but then go back to them. It's, it's sometimes very hard to adapt these and to get the sheer energy and the power of the imagination. You read something on page, and you imagine what it's like. You put it on screen and you say, it's not quite what I thought it 
what's going to look like. So, you know, is there an audience? Um, and I think, I'm going to make a comment here about the, the funding process today. I think an awful lot, I would say, of course, is here. But I think that even traditionally, a lot of effort has gone into assessment of scripts at the Film Commission, which are about the structure, whether there's a third act turning point, whether there's an antagonist and a protagonist. But believe me, if the protagonist kills his mother on the first page and rapes his sister and goes on the run and the third act turning point is terrific, it doesn't matter. No one's going to go and see the film. Um, John Clark, Fred Dagg, used to say that, <coughs> yes, Fred Dagg, in the great New Zealand novel, <coughs> there are two characters. One of them is a mean, ugly, who got no education and um, is interested in pulling everything down. The other one is a good looking, uh, intelligent, uh, caring, wonderful family man uh, who's uh, got his life stretched ahead of him and is uh, in the All Blacks and um, also back up to it for um, And uh, at the age of, at the, at the bottom of page one, the mean, miserable, ugly prick kills the other one. And the book's 300 pages long. And, you know, you have to watch it. Is that going to be a film? No one's interested. Right. Anyway. Um, are you consistent with the kind of things that you make? Uh, you know, that's more a question than you go. I mean, you, you just make everything that comes along when you want to make a statement. Because there's some films we've made, some films I've made, where possibly we made a statement, and that wasn't. But those films haven't necessarily continued. But, but consistently, if you want to make the audiences feel good, or if you want to change the way that they think about something, then that's a, that's a quality to hang on to. And if you make those films, whether it's an out of the blue or beyond reasonable doubt or a, or a heavenly creature, you know, I mean, these are three very dark moments in New Zealand history. And they make people think about the, the, the event and the, the reasons why people do something and, and the resolution of it. Um, so I think it's quite good. If you want the creative producer, and I think you should be, think this is the kind of film I want to make. Because I can tell you, we, we get about 300, 350 proposals a year. And the number of them that say, this will make a lot of money, is quite high. And we've never made one of those films, because it might. But that's not actually, if it isn't, if you don't like it, and, and you don't think there's an audience, and you can't make it, don't get, don't spend too much time worrying about how much money you could have made, because I actually haven't seen any of those films yet made yet. Um, is there anything similar, and why is this a factor? Um, I'm trying to think of some films. Uh, there were two Snow White films this year. Um, there were... Um, has anybody seen the Sapphires? Okay. Um, you think about that story, and you think about that's in the cinema, you know, could I tell a story that, about something similar? Uh, and what would people, what would people think? Um, it, it's a little bit complicated, but, but keep watching what else is around, because if the story's been told, oh, I tell you what, this, this um, and it's in the tr two Truman Capote films, um, one was called, Capote and one was called, the tourists. Yeah, yeah sorry. Yeah, and the first one out with um, Philip Seymour Hoffman. The guy Philip Seymour Hoffman. Philip Seymour Hoffman. Philip Seymour Hoffman. Philip Seymour Hoffman, yeah. Um, once that was out, the other film was dead. You know, it was a terrific picture. But that audience had seen those films. And sometimes you can't help that. You know, you've got the film in development, you've got money to have it in production. And whoever's doing the distribution might just be holding back because they've got a whole lot of other titles they want. And uh, that's, you know, that's always very unfortunate. Um, can you tell if there's a, uh, an audience? Have you spoken to an international distributor? Because New Zealand's a long way from anywhere. And we don't have any neighbours 
who are contemporaries. We don't have, we, we have a very, very general as a country, we have a very, very poor understanding of how other people respond to material and what we think is funny and what they will think of as funny when we, when we make it. And an international distributor, and the more you speak to, is going to tell you, yes, there is a market. But even before you ask them about it, there's any money. Do they think that this is a film that will work? Um, it's very important that you don't try and solve all these problems on your own. Um, have you spoken to any financiers? Because that's another trick. Most financiers and most international distributors won't say no. And <clears throat> you'll go to a market and you'll come back and you'll have had a lot of meetings. And you'll say a lot of people are interested. That's because no one ever says no. They say, if it's really interesting, keep me in full, keep me in full. If they're really keen, they'll say, can we sign this up? Ben talked about that yesterday. He had an offer by the end of the day. And the reason they don't say no is that your film might just break out. And of course, the famous one is um, uh, Crocodile Dundee, which got sent to all the studios in the US, and um, everybody thought it. Crocodile, some of said, you know, Crocodile. And people didn't see it. Some people actually lied and said they had seen it. Work. And then one guy looked at it and made an offer, and it was huge. It was a couple hundred million dollars in the state. So everybody else gets fired. You know, that's how it is. So no one says no. And that's true of television, isn't it, Kevin? Uh, you know, and, and, and certainly true of film, that they, you've got to keep all your options open. And another thing that you'll find is that if you announce your project, um, development of your project, and you get some money from the Film Commission in particular, and it's on the news film commission website, <coughs> you will get notes from used to be Paramount, Universal, Fox, um, I can't think who else, one, one other studio. The person who sends you the note, it's their job to track every film in the world and send you a note and say, I see you're starting so and so. We're really interested in this, keep us informed. And that's what they want to do. They've got to keep an eye on all these things. Um, it's flattering and it gives you a whole team of bit of gear. Yeah, that's all it means. It, you know, until you make the film that they really all do want to see, then you can go back to them and say, you said you're interested, I've got a film, I want the screening now. Sometimes then you find that they're not as keen to sit down with the screen. But, uh, um, then look at the criteria for the NZFC and New Zealand on Air. Uh, financing um, because some films get made because the local public financiers have got certain, th certain obligations to government to make certain kinds of films. And uh, that's not criticism. I mean, that's, they're being judged all the time on did you make a moral. You know, are 50% of the directors work? Um, is it going to be this kind of film or that kind of film? So quite often, things have been made to meet the political needs of the funder as opposed to the audience. And you just want to keep thinking about that. Now, also, sometimes you can exploit that to get the film made. It's not a bad thing. Um, New Zealand on air and the NZFC mostly have different criteria, um, whether the NZO, uh, whether NZOA is going to continue in film finance, we don't know, but, but um, you know, you've got, to, you've got to be across all this material all the time. Um, just talking about an audience, and this was a surprise to me because I was just doing the research and I thought this came up. Um, this was uh, actually a list from Oprah, I think, the top 50 chicks of all time, chick flicks of all time. Uh, one, two, three, four, Morocco, Camille, Notorious, and French Lieutenant's woman, but Bale Rider was 46, so, you know, you can't feel pretty pleased with that. Um, how, do you, how long do you keep developing? Um, I thought Ben made an interesting point yesterday about he, he wrote a draft and put it away for three months and he came back to it. But I think that as producers, you, you need to be, you need to keep the pace up on people. And wherever possible, 
if you can um, and this is going to be the next slide too. If you can do it without having to rely on the public funding bodies development process, you will find it goes a lot quicker. Um, so <coughs> the question, I don't know if there's anybody got, got any questions on the floor about this, but you know, an idea comes in, uh, you go and option the book or you get the road and write something, and you really pile it and try it and fake it and have a good think about what's come back to you. And another thing that you do, which in New Zealand doesn't happen enough, oh, well, I mean, the obvious, a very New Zealand response to this is, yeah, that's pretty good, let me think about it. Actually, a quick no is a hell of a lot better than, than hanging on forever. If you don't like it, if you don't like what you've got on the page, get in the room with the writer and discuss it. And let them tell you why they've done these things, or look right away with the director. And quite often they'll be right, but you just want to hear it. But don't just feel that you have to write back and say, oh, I think it's really good. If you don't think it's really good, you're the one who's got to live with it. You're the one who's got to make the film. And, you know, it's like a relationship. I mean, there's no point pretending that the person that you're going out with is the right person. Because sooner or later, somebody's going to say, well, you can get married. Well, actually, you know, I was looking for something quite different. Um, so, who sets the time agenda? You're your funder. And, and one of the things, again, Chris is here, one of the things that, that happens a bit with um, the funder, and I know that many of you rely on, on these funds, it means that when the script comes in, um, you're then waiting. You're not actually making the assessment. The funder's making the decision. The funder's the one who's going to give you nuts. The funder's the one who's going to tell you, we think it needs this or that. And you're going to wait for two months or three months. Or one month, okay, one month. Okay. Um, but, you know, traditionally what's, what's happened, we've seen a lot of this, is that people have written the script and it's gone to a development committee. And that development committee might be three people from here or one person from the, from the commission. And, um, Again, no one wants to say no. So they say, you know, maybe if the lead character was a guy instead of a woman, maybe if it was set in 1960 instead of 1950. And so these notes go back to the team, and the producer now feels that this is what the funder wants. So they go to the writer who's now busy. And about a year later, they turn up with all those things incorporated. And it's a development committee, and it's three different people from the room. And a different person on the commission said, What a lot of shit, what are you all this for? Really? I mean, it would be much better if it was the other way around. So another year is wasted. Well, that goes on. And so the more you can drive these things yourself, self censorship is just fabulous in this. And if you've got one or two close friends who you, who you trust and whose judgment you trust, get them there and set up an environment where internally you can work these things through all the time. And brief the writer, and brief the writer, and brief the writer, and encourage them to keep coming back with the forwards to discuss where they're going. And that way it will work a lot better than just turning in a draft to the commission. And you also know that out of every dollar that you get from the commission for development, most of it's going to the writer. It's not going to you. But you're actually keeping an infrastructure alive while this is going on. So you want to make this as, you want to try and speed this process up and be in charge of um, Here's a controversial one. Who picks the right of the director act to improve? Well, most of you find that producers have to sign off on this. Um, you're definitely going to go, you know, somebody's going to bring you a project. And even if they bring you a project and you like it, you're going to construct a contract that says, if this doesn't work, we are going to do the whole. Now, if somebody's brought you their life story and you've optioned it, and it doesn't work. It's their life story. They don't have a bad. It's, no, you know, you might say, "I want my development money back when it goes to if you ever get it made." But there's no point you hanging on to it because you're not going to write. You're not going to produce their life story. So let them their life story. Let them get on with it. When it comes to the director, you have to think about: Can you work with this person? Can you deliver this? Can you? Is this person going to 
realise on screen everything that you hope about this project. Um, actors, well, when you're picking the actors, you're picking more than just the people who are going to give the deliver the performance. You're thinking about what sort of publicity they're going to do. What's their career going to look like? How can I help build this career? Um, I mean, it's interesting with Keisha, we auditioned hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of kids, and she was only picked, I think, two weeks before we shot. We had three kids in the frame, and we only made a decision really in the last week. But when we shot the film, um, and we'd seen it, we, and we contracted it for the period, um, we looked and said, we don't want anybody else having Keisha in anything until we release the film. And so we put her on contract and paid her for the rest of the year because we didn't want to turn up the commission. We didn't want to turn up in, in some other film. So the first time anybody saw Keisha Castle Hughes was in the Wild Wild. And you know, you need to be thinking, the producers thinking about that, not the director of the writer. Um, the crew, well, you know, it's hierarchical, but you've got to know that the people that you've got as HODs are going to work with your director to realise what, what goes on. So, who has the final say? Well, you know, the producer. Uh, and quite often, that means really making sense of all. It, it's not about imposing yourself all over the production. It's about being a set of eyes that asks, why did you do this? How is the audience going to respond to that? Um, there are things that, are, for instance, if you make a film set in a Maori community and it's about a group of young kids and the dialogue is only understandable by the people about whom the film is told, it isn't going to work. It won't cross out. You've got to won't cross out. So you've got to you've got to be working with people to ensure that that the film's understandable to everybody. It doesn't mean diminishing the creative aspect of it. But you know, this is a, we're a small country, and you look at a film like Boy, which took ten million dollars, and I think it's fabulous. But it hasn't sold anywhere in the world, and and part of that is because in uh, artistically, a lot of the American reviewers and a lot of the, in fact, a lot of the reviewers, a lot of the academic reviewers, think that coming of age films are films like Wild Wild, or films that tell the story of a struggle of somebody against um, uh, a colonial oppressor. <clears throat> and what surprises them and actually embarrasses them about Boy is that you've got a group of, of people for whom a cultural icon is Michael Jackson, comes from another country. And they actually, the part, don't want to accept that. And so they're, they're very, very uncomfortable with that film. And for New Zealand films to sell anywhere else in the world, they actually need some critical and some award uh, backup. And we didn't get that. The film didn't work anywhere else. Now, personally, I think the fact that it took nearly $10 million in New Zealand is absolutely outstanding and it fulfilled every obligation that it had to do because it's a film by Kiwis about New Zealand, for New Zealand, and that's fine. But, but it's just that if you wanted, if you thought it was going to sell internationally, um, there are a number of three uh, big boxes that it doesn't tick. Um, and I think, as I said, it's possible that you make films that only work here, terrific, and you make some films that break out. And in the case of in the case of Wairawaira, we never ever sold that as a Maori film anywhere else in the world. Um, you know, the pitch was, for a thousand years, a group of people have lived in a village by the edge of the sea, uh, and in every generation, the chief has a son who becomes the next chief, cut to the present the chief has a daughter. And wherever we went, people got that. That's, that's common in almost everybody's, anywhere you go in the world, that's common. In, mythology and practice. And by the time we said, well, it's in New Zealand, oh, no, it sounds interesting, it's amongst American now, and so what. But, but if you try and look for what is it that connects to the person you're selling it to, um, that, that will help. Um, okay, this is something else as the producer, you're going to work out where your release plan is. This is called the competitive 
release schedule. And before, I don't know if you can all see this, but before you start the film, you want to think about where am I going to split up to set? Where am I going to release my film? Now, um, I'm just going to go through it. I'm going to this up. Let's say that your film does do well and you're given 
the, the, the director and the writer and the actors have all got some share in the, in the profit. Who's doing that? Because if it's you, you're going to have to be in business. In three years' time, five years' time, seven years' time, ten years' time, you're the producer, and, and it's your responsibility. And you know that's one of the things that says that you're. This is about longevity. It's not about single projects. Who's relicensing the film? Because most people who buy it, whether it's television in New Zealand with a five-year license, or your international sales agent, who might want a ten or twelve or even a fifteen-year license, there come a point at which that license expires. So who are you going to who are you going to relicense it to? Because some films have got longevity. Uh, conclusions I'm asking.